Nice to have you here, almost. Almost having you Thank here. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry I can't be there in person. So you, um, um, you work at Cardiff University? In- yeah, that's right. So, yes, I'm, uh, I'm a lecturer at uh, Cardiff University, which is in South Wales uh, in the UK. Uh, and I'm speaking to you from there uh, today. And you will have a lecture about uh, evaluating mobile applications in the wild, doing qualitative research and interpreting results. Yes, yes. Would you like me to get started just now? Yeah, you, uh, you're most welcome to start. Uh, you, you see the audience here. We have uh, had, had uh, two lectures already and just had a sure. uh, break. And they say hello to you here. <laughs> hello, everybody. <laughs> So I hand over to you then. Okay, thank you. So um, hello everyone. Uh, as um, as has just been said, uh, I'm speaking to you from Cardiff University in, in Wales. Um, first of all, I'm really sorry I couldn't be there in person. I would have uh, loved to have been there, but unfortunately I am teaching um, first thing tomorrow morning here. And uh, practically I wouldn't have been able to get back in time uh, to, to speak to my students. So. Uh, unfortunately, I can't be there for, for practical reasons. Um, but I'll do my, my best to um, present this to you virtually. If anything is unclear, please stop me or please ask me to clarify either during the presentation or later on. Um, I'm going to try and talk for about 30 minutes and I'll try and maybe keep it slightly shorter if I can to allow some time for questions at the end. Um, I'm going to talk to you, as, as has kind of already been said, about uh, the work of mobile applications outdoors. So the title of this presentation is to think about technology, uh, heritage interpretation, navigation, and interacting uh, whilst people are roaming in the wild. In the background of my first slide, um, you can see uh, the Brecon Beacons Hills. They're the kind of the, the hilly kind of mountainous area in South Wales. This is kind of one of the more dramatic areas, and it's it's these hills which are the kind of setting for the app that I'm going to talk about and the research that we have been doing. Um, but I should first say, and uh, hopefully moving on to my second slide, um, that I um, I'm speaking on behalf of a kind of bigger research team. So I'm a human geographer. I work at Cardiff University, um, but also part of uh, this research team include three others, uh, Dr. Rhea Dunkley, who is also here at Cardiff, and um, we've been working with uh, another partner from uh, the School of Computer Sciences at Nottingham University, who's a computer scientist, so we have some kind of computer science input on this project, uh, and another uh, lecturer at Edinburgh University as well. So we're part of a kind of bigger research team, and I've, I've put my contact details on the slide there in case anyone has any questions that they want to um, follow up with afterwards. But we've been partnering with um, one of the uh, national park authorities here in Wales and in the UK. Um, and our two major project partners are the interpretation officer at the Brecon Beacons National Park, Susanna Jones, who is actually largely uh, responsible for creating the app that I'm going to talk about today, and also their head of education, uh, Sunita Welsh at the National Park. So the research I'm going to talk about today has come from this collaborative work that we've been doing. And this is what we've been working on is, is really um, a bigger research project about the role of technology outdoors. Um, and our first kind of case study was to look at this mobile application, which is called uh, Walking with Romans, is the title of the app. Uh, some of you, I, I suspect, may have already seen it, but if you haven't, I say, if you're interested in uh, outdoor applications, mobile applications, I highly recommend downloading it and having a look for yourself. I'm going to show you some examples of what's in the app today, um, but it's, it's worthwhile having a look for yourself as well. So I'm going to be talking about our research about this very specific app. And uh, obviously, uh, we're only talking about one mobile application and uh, one type of use, uh, but I'm going to try and draw some kind of bigger conclusions for um, thinking about technology outdoors as well. So my presentation is really in two parts. The first part, I'm going to introduce the Walking with Romans app and the site, just to kind of give you some background information about the archaeological site and the historical site. 
I'm going to talk very briefly about some of the more quantitative evaluation data that was collected by the National Park Authority on the app. And then I'm going to talk you through some of the research that we have done already on evaluation. And I'm going to talk about the kind of methods of the data we collected, and I'm going to talk you through a little bit of the analysis as well. And I'm going to very deliberately keep the academic and the, the kind of more conceptual and theoretical content quite light today. I'm happy to talk about it in more detail. I'm going to talk a bit more about some of the kind of practical implications of what we been finding from our research. So just to give you some context, I know um, I, I kind of assume that most of the people in the audience are not from the UK or maybe don't know the UK that well. So to give you an idea of where we've been working, uh, the map at the top um, is uh, the UK and you can see the red dot is where we are based in South Wales. Um, we've been working in one of the UK national parks, uh, which is the kind of second map. Again, the red dot shows where the site is. And then the larger map is uh, a ordnance survey map of the site itself. And you can see the two circles, there's the larger archaeological site, which is a Roman camp, and the second archaeological site, which is a Roman fort. Uh, the small um, red dot that you can see there is where the visit uh, from visitors starts to this site. So they have to travel a reasonable number of kilometers to get to the site and to get around the site. Now, for the UK, I know this is probably quite different in the, the Swedish context, but uh, this is what we would consider to be relatively remote, uh, a relatively remote upland area. It, in the UK, I mean, it is very close to roads, as you can see, it's very close to settlements, but it's not particularly easy to find. There's no real signage uh, there to, uh, to direct uh, visitors to the site. Um, and effectively, the reason that this mobile application was developed that I'm going to talk about was because the Brecon Beacons National Park Authority uh, decided that they wanted to create interpretation for this uh, Roman site, because when they began their project, it had no form of interpretation, but that it would all be done through a mobile application with almost no signage or no traditional signs at all at the site. So that is, that's why the app was developed. And just to give you a slightly better idea of what the site looks like on the uh, uh, right hand side, well, one of the pictures shows um, two people using the mobile app on the site. And you can see that they're actually standing on a very slightly raised area. That's part of the Roman earthworks. So that's part of the archaeology that the site tries to interpret. On the other side, where there are no people in the picture, you can again see some of the uh, archaeology and um, the archaeological remains. Again, they're Roman earthworks. The small patches of snow actually helped capture the feature, which is a, a curved entrance to the Roman camp. But hopefully the two pictures give you some idea of um, some of the difficulties with doing interpretation at a site like this where some of the features are not particularly clear. So the main site is called Epigen. Um, it's a Roman marching camp. And you hopefully might be able to see here that there are actually two uh, Roman marching camps here overlaid one on top of the other. And my slide should hopefully show that. Yeah, so you can see now the second outline is appearing of the Roman camp. And um, these two uh, camps were built in around three to five hours uh, by a Roman army and um, only to be occupied by a single, uh, for a single night. Um, but they've left this kind of lasting legacy on the landscape and they've been there for nearly 2,000 years. The camps were designed to hold between four and 5,000 troops and all of their wagons and mules. And you can also perhaps see in the background of the slide there's a, a Roman, an old Roman road that connected them to it. The site has a number of... Oh, oh, yeah. Uh, just, uh, sorry to introduce you, uh, sorry to interrupt you, but um, could you just speak a little bit slower? Uh, there is some um, delay in the way we see your mouth is moving and the way you hear you talk. So, um, because then it's even more, uh, it's harder to hear. So please speak a little bit slower, please. Okay, yeah, no problem. Okay, so I'll move on to my next slide. There we are. 
Um, so the, the features of the archaeological site are reasonably clear from the air. Uh, you can see here on this aerial image, there's the corner of the site and also one of the main entrances to the site. Um, the problem is, is that if you are actually at the site, these are very, very difficult to actually see. Again, my image on the right hand side should show that this image, the picture on the right, is the entrance, and that's the entrance that you can see from the air as well. So in 2011, the Breton Beacons National Park Authority uh, applied for funding to do some interpretation of this site to make it accessible um, and to increase the number of visitors, to make the site more interesting and enjoyable for people and to encourage access to it. So from the funding they received, they built uh, a mobile app which was finished in 2013. So actually the app itself is quite old now, perhaps compared to some more modern applications. And you can see in the next, oh, there we are. You can see in this slide some of the features of the app. It's designed to guide people from a car park to the site, to provide some audio interpretation. So there is, there is an audio conversation between two characters. One is a Roman and one is an audio guide. And the application has GPS tracking. So uh, there is, um, you can see the map. It's not, sorry, the image isn't very good quality, but you can see here, there are a number of points and at each point there is some audio interpretation. There's also some uh, CGI reconstruction animations in the app to help visitors visualize the scale um, and the organization of the camp as well. So as I mentioned already, given that the application was uh, finalized in 2013, it's perhaps now relatively old uh, in terms of the features that it has, perhaps compared to some more contemporary apps. Uh, so for example, there's no augmented reality feature in it, which is, is perhaps now quite common in some interpretation apps. And just to say, before I start talking about my research on this uh, mobile application, um, the National Park itself does collect data on the number of downloads. So um, the average uh, for the summer months is one visit per day. Um, uh, overall, uh, the number of downloads is about one download every 1.5 days. And I think the total is just approaching 5,000 downloads over three years. Now, that's not very many. Uh, but given the nature of the site and the type of interpretation, uh, the, the National Park regards this itself as a success, I suppose. And they've also been collecting data on uh, what countries the app is downloaded in. Um, it's been downloaded, we've recorded it being downloaded in 43 different countries. Uh, the National Park, I think, would argue that this means that it's uh, being presented to a wider audience. Uh, I'm not really quite sure that that's necessarily a good interpretation. Um, there are various reasons, you know, why people might be downloading the app, uh, other than to look at to look at information about the Romans in a remote part of Wales. So, what we do with this data, I think, is uh, is difficult to say. But I'm going to move on now to the second part of my presentation, which is to talk about the research project we did for this app and our findings from it. Um, the picture is a group of outdoor practitioners 
uh, doing a kind of recreation of how the Romans would have defended the site. So I'm going to go on and talk about the research project. We were interested, myself and my research team, uh, to explore more generally how families and other groups use mobile technology uh, in the outdoors and in uh, various natural outdoor environments. Um, and we're also interested in how we can analyze this uh, in, a, in a qualitative way rather than just using uh, download data, site visits, and uh, more kind of quantitative data. So our... Oh, pardon me. So in order to address these, in order to address these pains, um, we used two methods to record data. We used on-body video cameras, which were attached to chest, harness, chest harnesses. They're very similar to a, a GoPro camera to capture uh, more naturalistic experiences. And we also did some screen capture on the mobile device itself, although that was sometimes problematic and we've had problems with getting screen capture from devices, uh, mainly due to software issues. Um, and we also had post experience interviews, uh, getting participants to reflect on their experience. We're interested in, in both of these methods because we find that uh, visits can last anywhere between two and four hours. Participants very rarely remember their entire experience, uh, even quite significant moments. It will be interesting to us as researchers and evaluators um, that may not be uh, you know, particularly relevant or significant for them. But we've also found that doing interviews with participants after they have done the app is very useful because it gets people to reflect on what they've done and how things could have been different for them. Today I'm actually going to focus just on some of the video capture that we've done. So as I've kind of mentioned already, our, our interest in uh, analyzing this work is to think about how we can get sort of rich descriptive information, not just visitor numbers, not just quantitative measures. And we were interested in a bit more than what simply does or does not work about the app. So we're very interested in what people actually do when they are there, when they're using it, how they interact with each other, uh, how they interact with the technology and the environment together. Sometimes we're interested in how they collaborate to solve problems, and also what kind of experiences and meanings are generated from this interaction. And our methods draw on two approaches which come from both computer science, uh, so looking at human-computer interaction, and human geography and social interaction research. Um, these two approaches are, and I'll, I'll try and keep this relatively short, uh, are to um, use ethnomethodology, which is an approach that investigates people's methods uh, for dealing with everyday situations. It's kind of like doing uh, ethnographic research, observing people, um, and thinking about what they are doing and why they're doing it. And the second is conversation analysis, so examining the sequence of conversations that people and have and thinking about what they're saying and what that means. So what did we actually do? We had uh, eight groups um, to, to trial the app on site wearing on body video cameras. Uh, one group, of uh, one family, um, a group of older adults who we're going to see in some of the video footage later, uh, one larger group of adults and five groups of two adults. Um, so couples, PhD students, friends, colleagues, quite opportunistic, but doing this kind of research is quite difficult to uh, gather respondents for. Um, they were simply asked to make use of the app on site. It took them anywhere between two to four hours. 
and this gave us around 24 hours of video footage, so quite a lot of video footage to uh, get through. And our analysis of this is ongoing, um, but we've developed four themes from it. One is thinking about how do people navigate around the site. The second is thinking about how they engage with the interpretation. Um, the third is around social interaction. And the fourth is about design and design of mobile applications. And uh, I'm going to talk about two of those today. Hopefully I've got enough time to do both. So actually I'm going to show you a brief clip um, from some of the footage we've recorded, but I'm going to ask um, um, the uh, technical team there, uh, either Per or Anders, if you're able to um, show the uh, video clip. Hello, uh, Anders or Per, are you able to show the video clip now, the first video clip? Yes, one second. We log into Wait one second. We do clip one. Yes, please. Just looking at the map on there, and it looks as though it goes, off it goes clockwise around it. And I think we're attempting to go anti-clockwise, but I'm not sure. No, we're not. We're oh? Going, oh, well, I don't know. I mean, there, yeah. six, seven. I don't. Yeah. Are, we, are we going across the middle? If you look very hard. Yeah, I think it is. I think we're going across yeah. the middle, aren't we? I think we are going across the middle, but more to the. Look, here we are at six. East. We're on the apex. Oh, you've made your screen much larger. No, we're here. I've just did that. We're here, ah, so we want to walk. We've, we've completely gone off the wrong way. Oh, well done. Well, I say if we, if we just go straight across here, we'll. There could be a bog. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So go back. Shall we cut Ooh, across? There's a little sheep's track there, isn't there? Yeah. But, yeah. Can we follow the sheep? Yeah. Oh. That's... Right. I think, in fact, your track initially was the right one when we came off the wrong one. We suggested you should come up this one, whereas you actually were going around that way. Well, I think I hadn't found how to expand the screen. Oh, we still haven't found it now. Whereas my dot was said we had gone past it. Okay, so hopefully you were able to see the clip. Um, can you hear me again? Is that okay? Yes, yes. Ah, good. Okay. So we've found with our uh, respondents, the people trialing the app, that because the site is so open and difficult to navigate, that a We're lot of them... Here. Oh? Okay, <laughs> I think that's the second video. That a lot of them uh, get uh, very lost. And it's surprising in some ways because the app provides uh, very accurate uh, navigational tools. So it, it, it uses uh, Google Maps um, and it has a, uh, a series of uh, tools that allow people to navigate around the site. But we find, and you can see on this slide, we used a GPS tracker as well to track where our groups went. We found that a lot of them got lost. They did not go in the correct direction, and then they spent some time finding out how to use the device to uh, get themselves correct. And this slide, I don't expect you to read it all, but it gives you an example of the kind of transcriptions that we produce from these short video clips. Uh, we use these short sections of video um, to analyze in depth what people are doing and how they you know, do different things with the app. Um, what we feel this very brief section illustrates is that uh, people actually 
uh, you learn how to use uh, features of the app, which are very essential for getting around the site and using the interpretation features. They learn how to use these features whilst they're actually on the move. So we see here that one of the uh, ladies using the app discovers the zooming in feature um, of the app. Now, this is a very simple tool that most people use on um, on um, mapping uh, software on their mobile devices, but it seems for this group that they don't quite understand how to fully use this. So the group appear to, to learn how to use this particular feature whilst they're on the move and already lost, not in the right place, rather than um, before they set off or before they go in the wrong direction. So what might seem like a very obvious feature of a mobile application might not actually be very obvious for all visitors, although visitors are capable of learning them as they go along. There's also a couple of other very interesting things that we think come out of this very brief clip that we've also found with others. So we've noticed that many people will follow uh, paths on the ground, so not actual uh, real marked footpaths, but just tracks created by animals, rather than where the device actually tells them to go. So there's a very accurate mapping tool on the device, but our respondents often ignore it um, to do other things, either to talk to each other, uh, to go in you know, whatever direction they think is the right direction but they don't always actually refer to the mobile application to do this. Another thing that we have noticed and that this clip highlights as well is that our different respondents often have different projects. Not all groups tend to collaborate particularly well. So you notice at the end of that clip, one of our respondents just walks off into the distance while the others are still discussing exactly where they will go. People have different priorities when they are you know, doing a visit. I'm sure we're all aware of this. Um, but the mobile application only allows for one particular type of visit. It guides people around in a step-by-step -step process. Uh, and so we find repeatedly that this is an interesting problem. So I think, would you, are you able to show the second clip now, please? Can you unshare your presentation? Oh, yeah, sure. Here. Right, press the five then. Right. Do I need to press the five? Yeah. Wait, no, shh, no, Sydney. Right, come on, go sit next okay, to Sydney. Okay, guys, we are now going to leave the track and head up the hill to stop six, where we can explore the inner marching camp. Are we not exploring the outer one as well? Well, we are, but we'll do that after. Clever thinking. He who chases two rabbits catches none. Right. Oh, that was it. Oh, um, crack it. Okay, thank you. And with that rabbit-based seal of approval, let us now go and explore the boundaries of the inner marching camp. Uh, that's the red square on the map. Right, I think... Yeah, the red square! <laughs> Can mummy have the map back now, Leo, because we're going off the track? You don't want to trip her. Okay, so we're going to have to... Which way do we go, mummy? I think up Stop. there. I think you're right. Do you want me to hold a sword? Don't just poke me with it then, just ask. Yeah. Okay, so um, just to reflect on that clip, uh, this is a family with two small boys 
and they're using exactly the same mobile application to get around the site. And you heard um, a little bit, just a little bit at the end of the um, audio of the app there as well. So one of the things we found with children and adults using the app together is that children seem to us to focus on quite different things to what the adults are interested in. So in this uh, clip, the boy in the red t-shirt uh, is really excited about the red square. Now the red square is just a navigational tool on the mobile app. It just displays the outside boundary of the camp. He keeps coming back to this and we've no idea why. He seems to be interested in this abstract thing rather than the Romans or uh, the Roman camp itself. But sometimes we found that parents will kind of ignore this. Uh, other times we found they will encourage it. So it's interesting to see how uh, young people and adults take quite different things from the audio narration. The second point that comes out of this clip uh, that I want to highlight is that um, parents, we found with our you know, brief study, parents manage how much children use the device. Sometimes they allow them to carry it and to use it. Other times they take it off them to allow them to run around. Sometimes the children actually give it back voluntarily to the parents because they can't carry it and run around freely without tripping over as well. So there's quite a lot of interesting things that go on with how families manage passing a device from one person to another, how much they allow their children to interact with the device. So those are just some of the kind of things that we have found out about how children uh, and parents uh, use the device together. So just to, so I realize I'm kind of coming up to my half hour of time. Um, I just want to kind of summarize some of our findings and some of the kind of implications for designing mobile apps around interpretation sites. Um, although we've uh, focused today or what I've talked about today is when people get it wrong and get lost, we actually find that people are able to um, use the navigational tools, but they learn them as they go. And that even though people might have a, uh, a very powerful tool that can uh, guide them around the site, they still follow their own intuition rather than the device. And they tend to learn on the move rather than understand it beforehand. The second uh, point I want to make is that children, uh, at least in our study, seem to find interesting things about the narration and about the app that we wouldn't have predicted. Um, we've been calling them sort of unintended kind of imaginative interactions with the app. And I suppose we have a question for, for app design and application design, which is, um, can apps uh, be used um, differently with uh, families, can they have different uses within them that allow for children and for adults? Um, we found with the interpretation element, which I've not talked a lot about today, but in this mobile app it's an audio interpretation, um, a lot of people will talk about the interpretation after they've heard the audio, talk about their own different things. And I suppose our question then for designers is, can and apps provide different resources for different groups within them and also to support how adults interact with children. So we found in our studies with uh, the family that the adults interpret or reinterpret a lot of what the device tells them for their children. I've also uh, discussed this with, with Per just before, our, um, just before organizing this talk and one of the uh, embedded features in the app that I've not had a lot of time to talk about is about sharing experience. And there's been a very poor uptake of this. So there's a feature in the app that allows people to share their ideas through social media, how did they experience their day. Uh, and there's been very poor uptake of that. 
and we we don't really know why that is so i guess another question for design that's come out of our study is how can um, interpretation apps encourage this kind of sharing of experience so that's the end of my presentation uh, I, I hope you've been able to hear enough or understand enough um, to, to get the gist of what I'm trying to say. And I'm happy to take any questions or go back and explain anything that's unclear. So thanks very much for listening and for, for persevering with the technology.